Good morning. My name is Myron Franz, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. I'm joined here today to uh, present the February forecast with State Economist Laura Kalimakidis and Budget Director Margaret Kelly. MMB's forecast documents are available online at mn.gov slash mmb under the tab labeled forecasts and updates. Well, let me start with the good news. We continue to forecast a sizable positive balance for the remainder of this biennium and the next biennium. The forecast balance for the remainder of this biennium, 2016-2017, is $900 million. The planning estimate for the next biennium, 2018-2019, is $1.2 billion. The Minnesota budget outlook remains stable despite a projection of lower economic growth. The forecast balance down from $1.2 billion in November is now $900 million. The U.S. economy and the Minnesota economy continue to grow, but the overall economic outlook has weakened. As we project slower economic growth, we have lowered our tax revenue forecast. Professor Klumbakidis will provide details about the economic outlook and the revenue projections for this biennium. We are seeing some savings in our public health care programs that will help to reduce overall state spending in this biennium. Budget Director Kelly will provide the details about projected spending for this biennium. The slower economic growth is estimated to continue into our long-term budget horizon 2018-2019. The story in Minnesota is that we continue to be in a strong financial condition. Minnesota is weathering the global slowdown well. For example, Minnesota maintains a positive structural balance for this budget and the next biennium. And just last November, we added $594 million to our budget reserve. The Minnesota economy continues to grow, though at a slower pace, and mostly due to economic factors external to Minnesota. In light of the current economic conditions, Minnesota, doing, Minnesota is doing quite well. At the February forecast last year, I said we had righted the ship. At the November forecast, I said that we had added ballast with $594 million increase to the state's budget reserve, which is now at $1.6 billion. Today, my theme is stay the course. The principles of sound fiscal management are important and bear repeating from previous forecasts because these principles remain the foundation of what we are trying to accomplish. Because of our adherence to these principles, we remain in a strong budgetary position in the face of a weakening economic outlook. Remember, I've said this before, with the times changing seven years ago, five years ago, and three years ago, we faced large deficits and owed billions of dollars to our schools. By focusing on sound fiscal management principles, we've paid back our schools, we enhanced strong revenues for the state, we strategically invested in education, we increased our reserves to the largest in state history. We carefully managed our state budget, and we've implemented strong management tools that have helped reduce health care costs, for example, such as renegotiating health care contracts for the state. But let me be clear, the Minnesota continues to be a success story. Minnesota has a balanced and a diverse economy, and that economy continues to grow just at a lower pace. We have the seventh lowest unemployment among the states, but as we plan for the legislative session and the long term, we must be mindful that our challenge going forward is that we must be attentive to all economic data. And just like everyone else, we will have to wait and see what the future holds. And we also must continue our efforts to do more to help all Minnesota families and businesses prosper, grow, and share in our state's well-being. Governor Dayton will review these projections and submit a supplemental budget on March 15. The governor will be available to the press at 2 p.m. today. Let's do the numbers. This slide shows that the revenues are down for this biennium by $427 million. The spending is also lowered, or is lowered by $129 million. Now you actually net those two negative numbers to come up with $306 million, and that's the reduction. $1.2 billion in November is now $900 million in the February forecast for the, for the remaining part of this biennium. And now I'll turn it over to Professor Klumbakidis to walk through the economic outlook. So I'm going to start with how the 
U.S. economic outlook has changed since we released our November forecast. Then I'm going to say a few things about Minnesota's economic picture and how that impacts the current revenue forecast. A slow finish to 2015, mostly due to reduced energy-related business investment, has weakened the U.S. outlook since our forecast was prepared last November. While some of the factors that slowed growth last year are expected to wane by the middle of this year, particularly, particularly that depressed oil-related investment, ongoing weakness in global economies and the strong U.S. dollar will prove more persistent drags over the next several years. The chart shows annual uh, percent change in U.S. real GDP, both the history and the forecast by Minnesota's macroeconomic consultant, IHS Economics. The dark bars show the forecast and the history, and the light bars show what IHS had in their November outlook. Uh, as you can see in their February forecast, IHS has lowered their overall growth expectations for the years in our planning horizon. IHS now calls for real GDP to grow at the same rate in 2016 as it did in 2014 and 15 at 2.4%. The November outlook uh, had growth of 2.9% for this year. Again, the lowered forecast for this year is largely due to temporary factors dampening growth at the end of last year. But as the drag from reduced business investment fades, some of the positives, positive factors in the U.S. economy are expected to take over. So steady job gains, low energy prices, and modest consumer price inflation should all support real income growth going forward and in turn should support consumer spending and home building activity. These factors are expected to bring economic activity back up to a moderate pace in 2017 when IHS expects real GDP growth to pick up to 2.8%. The IHS February economic outlook depends on a number of things. So a number of things that IHS has assumed will happen are embedded in this forecast. Particularly, IHS expects global growth to improve, which should allow the value of the US dollar to begin a slow multi-year descent in the latter part of this year. Improved growth in foreign economies, along with slower oil production, are expected to rebalance the oil market and permit a gradual recovery in prices by the end, later this year, begin a gradual recovery in prices later this year. IHS also expects further actions this year by the Federal Reserve to normalize uh, monetary policy, that is raise their target interest rate, uh, to go smoothly. In the February outlook, IHS assumes the next rate increase will come in June, followed by at least one more hike in the second half of this year. While the recent financial market volatility can be thought of as creating a negative wealth effect, meaning that uh, people who's, who feel that their assets are worth less will spend less, IHS also recognizes a positive wealth effect from increasing home values. And so on net, they expect these two things to be a positive for consumer spending. The factors that are shaping the global and U.S. economic outlook are also affecting Minnesota's economy. And in this chart, we illustrate two of those. The relative strength of the U.S. economy is attracting foreign investors. So while the U.S. economy is growing at a moderate rate, uh, for, foreign countries are, are um, growing at an even slower rate. And so that relative strength of the U.S. economy, in addition to uh, monetary policy normalization or interest rates, inc the, the potential of interest rates increasing in the United States, are attracting foreign investment. And that has driven up the value of the U.S. dollar. The trade-weighted dollar, meaning the value of the dollar where that is weighted by the amount of trade we do with the country so that our biggest trading partners get more weight in the value, uh, the trade-weighted dollar has risen by 22% against major trading partners since mid-2014, and that's what you see in the left-hand chart. A stronger dollar relative to major trading partners makes Minnesota-produced goods and commodities, including agricultural goods and manufactured goods, uh, more expensive for our foreign customers, reducing demand for the state's products abroad. Indeed, the dollar's strength is likely related to the fact that Minnesota's manufacturing activity appears to have cooled, and that sector is now expected to lower employment in 2016. We anticipate this to be followed by a modest increase in 2017 as world growth picks up. On the right-hand side, we show oil prices. Oil prices have fallen by more than 70% since mid-2014. This, of course, is a mixed blessing. Cheap oil means cheap gasoline, uh, which is big savings for consumers, and cheap oil is uh, a big saving for businesses that use petroleum products. 
But it also means lower investment among energy producers, and in particular, it means lower uh, oil drilling and exploration activity. But since Minnesota is not an oil producing state, we get the benefits of lower gasoline prices and generally lower consumer prices with less of an economic drag from the lower business investment. Because the lower business uh, investment due to oil related uh, exploration and drilling, drilling affects us mostly uh, indirectly rather than directly. So this is an illustration of how Minnesota's diverse economy, meaning economy where employment is widely spread across industrial sectors, rather than one where employment is, is concentrated in a volatile sector, that diverse economy creates resilience, which improves the state's ability to weather a slowdown. Minnesota's moving to uh, the labor market, or the labor situation. Minnesota's labor market continues to tighten up meaning it exhibits low unemployment and high demand for labor. Steady job growth has helped push the state's unemployment rate down to 3.5% in December, one of the lowest among states with metro major metropolitan areas and seventh among all states. Fewer people are being laid off, with the number of Minnesotans filing new claims for unemployment benefits down to levels not seen since the late 1990s, and the number of long-term unemployed and part-time workers who would prefer full-time work are both back to near pre-recession levels. MMB's February 2016 economic forecast, our current forecast, calls for Minnesota's expansion to continue over the next several years. But as the lower growth in the current US outlook feeds through to Minnesota's economy, we expect the state's economy to grow at a generally slower pace than we had forecast in November. The chart you see is, uh, shows annual growth in total wage and salary disbursements in Minnesota. That means uh, total of payrolls, uh, all the, the labor income that um, people get in Minnesota. And the height of the bars shows the growth, the growth rate uh, annually in that value. The dark bars again show the February the history and the February forecast, and the light bars show our November forecast. So if you look, that you can see that there's a change in uh, 2015. We have slower annual growth in wages, wages and salary income uh, in 2015 than we had in the November forecast. Uh, what we do is we look at data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and we look at the quarterly census of employment and wages, and we also look at Minnesota-specific information, uh, receipts from income tax withholding in order to estimate what wage and salary growth was in 2015, and, that, and we now uh, estimate that wages and salaries grew at 4.7% in 15 compared to the 4.9% we had in the November outlook. Uh, as I discussed or presented in November, Minnesota job growth is being constrained by the long-awaited slowdown in labor force growth due to baby boom retirements. Consequently, both employment and total wage income growth are expected to remain modest in 2016 and 17. So total wage income uh, growth, the, the growth we see here, uh, is the result both of employment growth and average income, uh, average salary growth. We now expect total Minnesota wage and salary income to grow by 3.8% this year compared to 4.5% uh, that we had for 2016 in the November forecast. And income, wage and salary income growth for the remainder forecast is also lowered by small amounts. So there is still growth in wage and salary income in the forecast. It's less growth than what we had um, in the prior forecast. So that directly influences the revenue story. This table shows uh, forecast revenues uh, for, this, uh, for this forecast. Total general fund revenues for FY16-17 are now forecast to be $427 million less than what we had in the November forecast. And total tax revenues for the biennium are forecast to be $465 million below the prior estimate. You can see in the change column for all the major tax types that lower expected, uh, that we are we're expecting lower, um, our forecast has been lowered for each of the major tax types. So they're all moving in the same direction this time. Uh, generally, the story is pretty simple. Slower growth in forecast economic activity is reducing our expectations for receipts from all the major tax types. Individual income tax receipts are now forecast to be $95 million less than what we had in the November estimate. 
This change arises from a decrease in assumed tax liability for 2014. So 2014 is the base year for the forecast, and we now know that we have uh, lower uh, tax liability for 2014 than what we had estimated in the November forecast, as well as lower forecast income growth from 2015 to 17. So it is still income growth, but they're, the growth rates are smaller than what we had before. So many of our income types have slower growth in this forecast than they had in the prior forecast. I, I already mentioned wages, wages and salaries, but uh, business income, dividend income, interests, capital gains realizations, all have slower growth in this forecast, bringing down the individual income tax forecast. Among major tax types, the sales tax shows the largest dollar amount decrease uh, from the prior estimate, the $311 million you see in the, in the table. This change reflects lower than expected sales tax receipts so far in fiscal year 2016. So since our November forecast, sales tax receipts have fallen short of what we had expected um, in the November forecast, and so that lowers our expectations going forward. In addition to weaker projected taxable sales growth in calendar year 16, uh, and to first half of 2017. So we have that lower base for the sales tax in addition. Because of that lower GDP forecast, that also brought down expectations for growth in consumer spending and, and for a number of the uh, spending categories that are taxed under Minnesota's sales tax. Uh, and then finally, in this forecast, uh, uh, slower projected growth in corporate profits reduces the forecast for um, net corporate tax revenues by $93 million. So that's, that's the forecast. I wanna, I've wanna i already talked about a number of the risks to the forecast or the things that could make the forecast be different, uh, the outcome to be different from what uh, we are expecting. Um, I've talked a bit about some of the commodity prices um, regarding agricultural commodity prices, low, com low agricultural prices, including uh, low prices for corn, soybeans, hogs, and dairy, all took a bite out of farm profits last year. And we have another small decline in farm income in the forecast for 2016. Uh, low iron ore prices that have iron ore prices have plummeted due to uh, increased capacity for production in a number uh, number of places around the world. In addition to the slowdown in economic growth in China and in other countries, that has pushed iron ore prices down. And low iron ore prices have led to the slowdown and idling of mines and laid off, layoffs in uh, Minnesota's iron range. Uh, regarding international trade, uh, the macroeconomic forecast from IHS expects the economies of our trading partners to recover and the dollar to begin to decline later this year. The longer it takes for that to happen, though, the longer manufacturing activity will stay restrained. I've said that IHS expects monetary policy, this, this adjustment from accommodative monetary policy to more normal, increasing interest rates, to go smoothly. But if it is uneven, then that creates uncertainty and that can affect consumer confidence and business confidence. This forecast assumes that despite the tightening labor, market, labor um, supply that we have due to demographic change, that improved average wages and salaries is gonna pull a few more people off the bench and into the labor market. So we have some small, a small increase in labor force growth uh, going forward. Regarding revenues, uh, to, the um, even very small changes in the growth rates of uh, capital gains and corporate profits those are our two most volatile revenue sources. Uh, even very small changes in those growth rates can have large changes in revenues, uh, especially in the out years. And finally, um, to date, we have collected about 28% of forecast revenues for the current biennium. And with uh, 17 months left, to, uh, left in the biennium, we have 72% to collect. And so any, <clears throat> excuse me, any changes in the economic uh, assumptions going forward will affect uh, the, those revenues. I'll now turn it over to Budget Director Kelly. Thank you. I'm going to speak to the spending side of the story and how this forecast impacts our next biennium. So first, our forecast is down in the current biennium. Spending is down compared to the November forecast. Spending continues to grow year over year, just not as, just at a slightly lower rate. So with this forecast, we have a $41.5 billion budget for the 16-17 biennium. 
$129 million lower than we were projecting in November. This is just a minor change uh, in our forecasted spending, only three-tenths of a percentage point change. So like previous forecasts, the big story here is in medical assistance spending, where we, in the health and human services area, we have $130 million of lower spending. And specifically for medical assistance, it's in our CHIP, or Children's Health Insurance Program. Federal legislation in 2015 provided for an enhanced match for states for CHIP expenditures. And in January of this year, additional federal funding su to support the enhanced match was made available to states. So this represents a tripling of the funding that the federal government has provided to states, uh, for Minnesota in particular, for CHIP funding. And it has the effect of lowering our state expenditures for Medicaid. And so while these savings on our CHIP program continue into the next biennium, enrollment growth that we're starting to see in this biennium is going to outpace the savings, um, and we'll see just a small amount of savings next biennium. Uh, in education, education spending is up slightly by $11 million. Again, a very small change for the largest area of our budget. With each forecast, we revise the number of students uh, enrolled based on actual experience. And so this forecast reflects a small increase in students or pupil counts. That is the basis for our, uh, our formula. And in addition to this increase, there's also additional actual experience of higher costs related to special education that is uh, driving the funding needs up in this area. Those two increases are offset by savings related to the number of students in poverty. So our co poverty concentration is the basis for some of our general education funding as well. And those concentrations, the rate of growth in the concentration of students in poverty is slowing. And so we have some offsetting savings to our increases. This biennium, 11 million up. Next biennium, we actually see savings in the education area. Property tax aids and credits, really a minor change here, just slightly down from uh, in this biennium compared to November, less than a tenth of a percentage point change. Personal income growth in calendar year 15 drives our spending up in this area, or actually contributes to savings in this biennium. However, the slower growth that's in assumed in the economic forecast is going to start materializing in the 18-19 biennium, and we'll actually see higher spending for property tax aids and credits. So the question then is how does this forecast affect uh, next biennium in 18-19 planning estimates? Again, these are projections looking pretty far out into the future. But the changes in revenue will continue, the slow growth will continue, and we'll see a reduction of revenues compared to November of almost $900 million in 1819. Spending will continue to see some savings, but Pretty minor, $36 million. Overall, we're going to take $861 million out of our structural balance. So we'll go from a $2 billion structural balance to $1.184 billion of structural balance in 1819. And again, inflation is a pressure on our budget that we need to pay attention to. With that, I will turn it back to Commissioner France. Thank you, Margaret. The last slide, I want to return to this theme I mentioned earlier, structural balance. One of the things that we, we look for in uh, our balance going forward is, do we have a forecast balance for the current biennium? Yes, we do, $900 million. Do we have one for the next biennium? Yes, we do, $1.2 billion. This chart shows that on an annualized basis, our revenues are growing at about a 4% increase per year, and the projected spending is 3.5% another way to look at structural balance going forward. One of the things that we need to be mindful of this session is how to balance spending uh, requirements or spending proposals this year and how they will affect the next biennium. We need to talk about ongoing spending items versus one-time spending. Ongoing spending items are those things that occur in the next biennium because of the nature of the program. And obviously, uh, in this particular situation, if you spent all 900 million on ongoing spending, and it was just it was for one year. And the next biennium, you'd double that to 1.8 billion if there were if the tails were flat, which is never the case, or rarely the case. So we need to be really careful about how we spend money in this biennium, and how that's projected into the next biennium. 
One of the examples of one-time spending is the governor's proposal for broadband spending around the state, which would be a one-time spending proposal. An example of ongoing spending would be permanent tax cuts that would have spending effects this year as well as into the, ne into the next biennium. One of the uh, last items I want to mention is the idea of investing. To the extent that there's a desire to invest more in Minnesota, one of the best vehicles to do that with a low budget cost is the capital investment budget. So the, cap the bonding bill is one way that we recommend using as a vehicle to invest in Minnesota with a small budget cost and also uh, provides uh, projects around the state. As you know, we've recommended a $1.4 billion bonding bill at this time. For those of, those, for those of you who uh, see the glass half empty versus half full, uh, there's always a rainy day fund or the reserve that we can put more money into. There's no automatic addition to the reserve in the February forecast. That automatic addition to the reserve only occurs in November, but the legislature can add money to the, bond, to the reserve at any time. But structural balance is the one of the sound fiscal management principles that I talked about because it shows that year after year our revenues continue to exceed our expenditures. And to the extent you see spending cut proposals as a way to increase available balances, we must be careful to examine those to make sure they do not include any accounting shifts or hypothetical savings. And program cuts must be really specifically identified to make sure that we're looking at balancing the budget in very specific ways. So let me conclude by saying that the Minnesota economy continues to grow, though at a slower pace. Minnesota's budget continues to be in a strong financial condition. Minnesota, as Professor Klumbakitis mentioned, is weathering the global slowdown well. Minnesota maintains a positive structural balance for this budget and the next biennium. And with that, we're happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Of the, the 900 million projected surplus, uh, how much of that is, uh, do you, can you predict, is a one-time uh, versus a, a ongoing that can be expected to continue? Well, let me let's first go back to this slide. You know, one of the, one of the things that when, we, when you look at the uh, forecast, you're doing a couple things. You're taking a snapshot in time, and you're looking at what's happened over the last seven months. Right now, we have seven months worth of the current biennium that we can take a look at the results, and we're looking at 17 months into the future. So this, this projection is a future projection of the amount of resources that we're going to have available for the rest of the biennium. And we also, as you can see, we project more uh, resources into the future. So what the forecast does is to try to pro project as best we can what available resources will occur in the future. So at this point, uh, it doesn't really make so much difference in terms of characterizing it as ongoing at one time. What it shows us is the available balance that we have in this budget cycle and the next budget cycle. How about where revenue is down? Corporate tax is the largest percentage. Can you speak more to that? Well, I think as uh, Professor Klumakitis mentioned, overall corporate profits have been uh, are down around the, in, in the U.S. and in the world, I believe. And so one of the, that's just going to be one of the things that falls through to, uh, to Minnesota to the extent that those uh, profits are down. We're going to see fewer, fewer revenues from corporate, uh, corporate returns. Are Minnesota's corporations weathering it better than the nation or the world? I think Professor Klumakitis kind of has an example about it. It would be helpful. So uh, the, in, the, in this forecast, we have l slower corporate profit growth than we had in the prior forecast. And that is piece, that's information that we get on the national economy. So there's, there isn't, we don't have specific information about growth in uh, Minnesota corporations. But to be clear, corporate profits have grown, grown uh, at very high rates in recent years. So it's not surprising to see, corporate profits are very high, so it's not surprising to see, the, see them slow down. Um, in terms of uh, Minnesota corporations. So Minnesota's corporate profits tax or corporate franchise tax is uh, levied on a sales, uh, sales only basis. And so we collect tax on corporations that sell into the state of Minnesota. It's not differential regarding uh, co companies that are uh, here, uh, located here versus located elsewhere. General sales tax, that was the second highest percentage in that category. So a couple of things going on in the general sales tax. One is that in the fiscal year so far, we have collected less in uh, sales tax receipts than what we had forecast in the November forecast. And so sales tax receipts have been falling short of what we had expected. So that lowers our expectations going forward. And then the lower US real GDP growth forecast in, uh, embedded in that 
is lower expectations for growth in consumer spending. Consumer spending still grows, it's just at a lower rate than what we'd had in November. So that feeds through to our consumer spending, to our uh, general sales tax. And any breakdown on what type of sales are down? Uh, in the forecast? Yeah. Um, if you look, it, we, um, we can look at components of spending in our forecast and almost all of the various components that are taxed under Minnesota's general sales tax have a lower growth rate than what we'd had in November. Uh, so, um, you know, consumer durable goods, consumer non-durable goods. Um. Following up on that while you're there, um, does the Minnesota consumer spending differ much from the national? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, so uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know the answer to that. If you're, if you mean um, growth rates in consumer spending, I I would have to reconstruct our forecast because we do look at different components. And so uh, what I would say is that overall changing rates uh, of growth in consumer spending don't translate like dollar to dollar into the general sales tax because our tax base is made up of a bunch of things that are taxed, a bunch of things that aren't taxed. You have to look at all those individual components. And so you can't, you can't just look at a percentage change in, in consumer spending and then say that's how much the sales tax is going to fall. Uh, another, um, another factor affecting uh, the sales tax receipts is um, law changes. And so there was a law change regarding um, capital equipment investment that went in place last year that adds some uncertainty to the, to the forecast. The uh, slowdown in the labor growth, in part due to baby boomer retirement. So what impact is that going to be having on us down the line? Right. Uh, so this is long awaited. We've known for a long time that the baby boom, this big population of people, was going to start retiring, and that that has has already and will continue to slow labor force growth in Minnesota. So. Um, we, uh, you know, in, in the, the 80s and 90s, we used to expect, um, you know, one and a half, two percent growth in labor force annually. Uh, now we uh, expect less than one percent growth in the labor force annually in Minnesota, and that is a direct result of the demographic uh, conditions. So what does that mean in the forecast? That is embedded into our forecast and has been for a while, so that's not something that has changed relative to November. Um, but what it means is that uh, it's, it limits the ability to uh, increase employment growth because you get employment growth or job growth when you have a job and you have a person in that job. And so uh, as the labor force growth slows, employment growth can only go as fast as that labor force growth slows. So that's part of the tightening labor market in Minnesota, low unemployment, high demand for labor. And what we think going forward, because we have forecast moderate wage and salary income growth, is that more of that total income growth is going to be the result of average incomes growing, because uh, employment growth is going to slow. So employment growth slows, but average incomes increase. And that's what makes up our uh, wage and salary income growth forecast. Expect more people to go back into the labor force because of the higher incomes. Yes, we have a small. Even within the context of the baby booms, baby boomers retiring, we have a small. I can't remember how much, but we have a very small um, increase in uh, labor force growth going forward to try to pull the last few people off the bench and into the labor market in Minnesota. Are any of the these uh, revenue areas actually decreasing uh, by any millennium, or are they all just growing, growing but at a slower rate than projected? They're growing at a slower rate. How about household formation? Last forecast, mm -hmm. last couple of forecasts, that was a big warning sign, the slowdown in household yeah. formations, but it appears at least nationally home building activity is going up. Can you square those two things? Yeah, and we and home building activity went up in Minnesota last year as well. So uh, we do expect household formations to to come back, not quite to the levels they were before, but to get back to a, a more normal level as job growth and um, uh, as employment growth improves or as employment growth continues and as wages wages and salaries increase. We do expect uh, that to happen. And what happened in Minnesota, the, one of the ways home building affects this forecast for Minnesota is that we had strong home building activity last year. In this forecast, that increases the demand for tradespeople next year for this um, 2016.
Professor, um, what can you tell Minnesotans, and you've watched a lot of these cycles before, mm -hmm. Are we headed toward another recession, or at least a significant slowdown, um, over the next year or two? Uh, so this forecast, as you saw in the charts, has uh, annual real GDP growth. Uh, oh, sure. Thanks. Um, annual real GDP growth in, uh, in the range of 2.4, 2.8, 2.7, 2.6. 2.6. So that's growth. Uh, it's, uh, going forward, uh, the long-term long forecast for U.S. real GDP growth have growth has growth lower than what we used to expect prior to the Great Recession. Prior to the Great Recession, the averages were around 3.1 percent, and so there's growth in this forecast. Uh, there is also risk to this forecast, and I outlined a number of those risks. So um, the the there have been changes in the economy since we presented our November forecast, including um, increased stock market volatility and uh, commodity prices staying lower longer than expected. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing that has brought this forecast down relative to uh, to what it was. And will you explain a little bit more why low, low oil prices aren't just really good news for Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Uh, they are really good news for, for Minnesota consumers because it translates directly into gas, lower gasoline prices and that allows consumers to divert some money away from uh, the gasoline toward uh, buying other things. Uh, in addition, low gas prices lower overall consumer prices because a lot of manufacturers of consumer goods use petroleum products. So, um, so that's, that, part, that part is all good. The negative side of low oil prices is that it reduces um, uh, oil exploration and drilling activity in the United States. And that has taken a larger bite out of U.S. real GDP growth than had been expected prior. And so that lowers overall U.S. growth, and Minnesota is tied to the U.S. economy. So it feeds through to us that way. In addition, um, low uh, drilling and exploration um, can reduce uh, demand for domestically produced steel, which can uh, reduce demand for iron, uh, iron Minnesota taconite. North Dakota's cold? No. So is this slow growth, as an economist, is this the post-recession slower growth? Is this the new norm? The the new the new normal what is uh, slower growth resulting uh, from a couple of key things, one being demographic change. So the baby boom retiring slows employment growth, slows everything down. Another issue in the fact that long-term forecast for US real GDP growth is lower than it, um, than it was prior to the Great Recession is because of um, the of federal, federal debt, US federal debt and, and uh, the stru structural challenges at the US federal level um, becoming, becoming bigger drags on the economy going forward. Uh, so as I said, prior to the Great Recession, the, the uh, expected, we would expect to see 3.1, 3.2, 3.5% growth going forward. Um, I think it's 2.5% on average. So is, are, is, are the levels we're seeing now, or the growth rates we're seeing now, directly a result of that? They're, they're happening concurrently with that effect. And in Minnesota, it's happening concurrently with um, the baby boom retiring and labor force growth slowing. But there are a lot of other things that are affecting growth rates year to year. And as I've, as I've described, a number of them are external to the United States. Earlier you mentioned the diverse economy creates resilience here, but farm income was down. Kind of post-recession, farm income was a bright spot. It sounds like that's turned. Can you talk about why that's happening? Yes. Yeah, so um, 2012, 2013, uh, big years for farm profits, good years for, um, for commodity prices. Uh, the, one of the things, and, and so farm incomes and commodity prices changing now are coming off of that, that, th that high base. And what was happening building up to that was growth in emerging economies, growth in China, sort of stronger global growth. Uh, and as that has slowed down, we've also had uh, years where uh, corn and soybeans in particular have had record harvests. So those things working together with global demand falling, the dollar being stronger, so that reducing the ability of our foreign consumers to buy our agricultural commodities, and uh, uh, um, 
supply being increased or harvests being strong, those things have, have brought down uh, commodity prices and with them farm incomes in Minnesota. So that those the um, reductions in growth that we have in uh, farm incomes are uh, coming off of a high base and due to, uh, to the, all of those factors. Am I reading this right that nearly half of the Iron Range mining jobs are now either resulting in layoffs or slowdowns and it won't recover for years? Is that what you're saying? So we, uh, we um, lowered our forecast for mining, the mining and logging sector, which is where the Iron Range jobs are, uh, in the November forecast. And so we looked at all of the, the jobs that had been impact in 2015 and that we were expecting to be uh, impact and took those um, jobs that made that reduction in the November forecast. Uh, so the change in this forecast is relatively small because we had taken that, um, made that change prior. We've got time for one more question. Commissioner, a question for you concerning the, the 1819 uh, planning estimates. Are you concerned that the uh, structural balance that you're now showing is actually smaller than the estimated inflationary growth during that period? And are you concerned that we've had such a dramatic change, uh, more than $850 million, in that uh, uh, structural balance between the last forecast and this one? One of the, th uh, one of the concerns that we do have is that <clears throat> with, the, with the reduction in the balance for 18 and 19, it does but up against the inflationary pressures that we see. And one of the things that we do in providing that inflation uh, cautionary number is to let policymakers aware of, of that conflict, if you will. So the estimated inflation we provide here goes is applied to all spending. Now some spending does include inflation, so it's an overestimate of what inflation is. But that is obviously something that we all need to be mindful of as we project spending into the future uh, what what role we don't know exactly what inflation will be and it's obviously all these numbers We don't have a budget yet for 18 and 19 So there are a lot of variables in play in 18 and 19 But certainly we want to be cautious and watch what inflation might do so it, it is of concern and we'll watch it carefully